reject his gifts, his children, he, he makes them barren. Because women have become sterile out of abortions. I mean, that's obvious. That happens all the time. But I just want to let you know that the consequences of your decision is before God, you've now become a murderer. When I feel afraid, uh, when I walked into my office and found 14 bullet holes shot through the window that I usually sit in front of. I believe in the seed of life, and only God can give the seed of life. And man is trying to take it. The anti-abortion movement speaks in absolutes. They say an unborn fetus is alive from the moment of conception, and interruption of a pregnancy is murder. In truth, theologians disagree on the exact moment the soul enters the body. The makers of this video are not religious philosophers. Our aim is to demystify this complex, volatile issue. The emotional rhetoric of the self-proclaimed right to lifers clouds the real issue. This is a question of constitutional rights and preservation of personal freedoms. We are not talking about groups exercising their free speech rights. Of course we want them to be able to exercise their free speech rights. But we don't want them going further and intimidating people who are exercising their rights guaranteed under the law. We want you to understand the facts and to be able to clarify them for others. The anti-abortionists have a powerful organization across this country. We targeted 12 U.S. senators who were pro-abortion and defeated 10 of them. So we feel that uh, anyone who we're working for has an added advantage, and we also feel that anybody we're working against is in very serious trouble. We believe, as did the founding fathers of this country, that religious freedom is one of our inalienable rights. It matters not what personal conclusions the so-called right to lifers draw from their religious teachings. We do not support their forcing those conclusions on others. The point is, what happened in Nazi Germany, what happens in Soviet Russia, is that a group of people say, our law must be your law. They say there's no room for pluralism. There's no room for people to disagree. That is what you are saying to me. As an American who believes in this country as deeply as anybody, I resent it. Well, I and I think there are millions of people who resent it. I and hope then you what do. you do, then you say it's okay for me to advocate illegal acts because my law is higher than yours. You have probably heard of the landmark Supreme Court decision, Roe versus Wade. The general understanding of this case is that it made abortion legal. What it did not do was give women abortion on demand. During the first trimester, a woman may have a legal abortion with a doctor's consent. During the second trimester, the individual states can pass regulations governing a woman's right to an abortion. And during the final trimester, an abortion is not permitted. Frank Sussman is a Missouri attorney who specializes in constitutional law. He has been involved with Roe v. Wade from the beginning. This spring, he will argue before the Supreme Court to uphold its original decision. Frank, could you give us a little background on Roe v. Wade? Certainly. The historic decision and far-reaching decision of Roe v. Wade was decided by the court on January the 22nd of 1973. That decision established for the first time a federal constitutional right based on the right of privacy for a woman in consultation with her physician to terminate a pregnancy if she so chose. Since that time, states have attempted to regulate abortions while trying to be consistent with the ruling in Roe v. Wade, and there have been over 20 other abortion cases decided by the Supreme Court in the last 16 years. All of those efforts by the states have been unsuccessful, and those who have been championing the rights of women to abortion services have succeeded with two possible exceptions. We have been unsuccessful in establishing a constitutional right for the use of public funds to pay for indigent abortions, and we have been unsuccessful in guaranteeing to minors the full range of rights that adult women have when it comes to choosing or electing abortion. Can you tell us about the case that's before the court now and why it's so important? Webster versus Reproductive Health Services represents the greatest threat to abortion rights since the original decision of Roe versus Wade for several reasons. One, this is the first time that the present court, the present nine justices, have ever participated in an abortion case. Secondly, and more importantly, this is the first time that the state defendants, as well as the Solicitor General on behalf of the United States, 
have, in a frontal attack, without reservation, asked the court to reverse Roe v. Wade. They have never taken this kind of position before. And what would be the legal consequences if the case is overturned? The legal consequences would be disastrous. First of all, this issue would be sent back to the state legislators, in which we would see terrible fights, terrible divisiveness throughout this country. Making abortion illegal does not stop abortions. Mm -hmm. Women have always had abortions. Women will always seek abortions and obtain them. Could you tell us about parental and spousal consent? In 1976, in the Danforth case, the Supreme Court ruled that states could not require either spousal or parental consent on the theory that if the state could not tell a woman that she could not have an abortion, that they could not delegate that same authority to another party. Can you tell us what you would expect if the case is simply amended? It would depend on what manner the court tried to retrench. Uh, if they, for instance, changed the standard of review, we would again see many state legislatures adopting regulations trying to prevent abortions. They always do this under the guise of protecting women's health, mm -hmm. but it is simply a ruse. It is never really directed towards women's health. It's to stop abortions. Now that you have a better understanding of the legal background of this conflict, let's examine the procedure itself and an alternative. We are pleased to have Lorraine Rothman with us today. Ms. Rothman is the inventor of the menstrual extraction kit, as well as being the, one of the founders of the self-help group concept in women's health care. She is co-author of A New View of a Woman's Body and How to Stay Out of the Gynecologist's Office. Today, she serves as a consultant to the Federation of Feminist Women's Health Centers. Lorraine, why don't you begin by telling us what a menstrual extraction is and under what circumstances you advocate its use? Mm -hmm. Menstrual extraction is a method that was developed by women early on in 1971 where within ad advanced self-help groups of women, now this would be a small group of women of three or four or five who know each other very well and have worked together over a period of time so that they have come to know each other's health concerns and have learned to do self-examination of their own bodies and, and have shared this with others, have also learned the technique of menstrual extraction and so that as a group they can in fact extract one another's periods on or about the time that they would expect their periods. And it's a very interesting procedure, and it's a, a reasonably simple procedure. However, it is important that women work in a group and learn to use the procedure because it's not something that we would consider doing on ourselves. There's safety when we're in a group, first of all, with knowledge of how to use it. And during the time that we do use it, uh, we can all watch to make sure that, for example, the uh, items of the menstrual extraction kit that's used that would go into the woman's uh, cervix or her uterus is sterile and everyone can watch this. So there's just safety factors involved. The reasons why women may want to use this technique, and some of them are make it quite popular, is um, there are some women who find that they have quite strong cramps when they uh, have their periods. And uh, menstrual extraction can help alleviate uh, the cramps by removing, in this, in many cases, the clots that could create the cramps. Of course, the most popular reason is the fact that menstrual extraction can be used to remove a fertilized egg. If a woman should suspect that she became impregnated one of those times in the previous month, then on or about the time of her period, she can call her group together and they can suction the contents and, and remove her menstrual flow mm -hmm. and uh, almost always also get that little fertilized egg as mm -hmm. well if there is one there. Mm. So. How did you get involved with the movement? I had been working with abortion uh, reform in the late 1960s in Orange County and uh, in 1971 I had heard about a uh, meeting that was planned in Los Angeles for anyone who was interested in really beginning to grapple with the issue of abortion. I had gone through the frustrations of demonstrations and the other things that we did way back then with not much success in getting the abortion laws changed and I attended the very first self-help group meeting that Carol Downer organized in Los Angeles and it was at that time Carol showed us a uh, 
a plastic uh, syringe and a, and a, a straw like device that I then adapted to the kit that we now use mm -hmm. and to have continued with the self help group since then. Lorraine, could you tell us a little bit more about a typical self help group and also if women are interested, how can they start one? Self help groups are actually groups of community women who've come together to learn from each other. Uh, they're oftentimes friends who bring friends, and they're generally small groups. They learn to do self-examination using a plastic vaginal speculum, and they learn to insert it into their own vagina. They learn about their own bodies, and they share this with each other. In this way, we get a much broader picture of what the normal range of women's healthy bodies are like, mm -hmm. and the kinds of problems that we as uh, normal women generally uh, find during the course of our lives as women. Uh, for women who are interested in finding self-help groups to join, or if they're interested in starting a self-help group, mm -hmm. I would urge them to contact women-controlled clinics in their own communities. If there are feminist women's health centers in their communities, that would be a good start. Uh, if there aren't any feminist women's health centers or women control clinics in their communities, then they may want to call the Federation of Feminist Women's Health Centers or contact them in Los Angeles, mm -hmm. and they could best help to make connections. Sometimes there are self-help groups out of uh, local NOW chapters, National Organization for Women. There are self-help groups that have uh, organized out of women's church groups, ah. uh, sisterhoods, uh, and sororities from colleges. They're all over. It takes a little bit of ingenuity to find, but I would suggest to start with uh, the women co controlled clinics mm -hmm. in your community or in, in the wider community. Thank you. Now we'd like to take you to an actual self-help group meeting where self-exam, menstrual extraction, and abortion are explained and demonstrated. We're going to lay down um, a runoff and we will have more speculums of course and you will have a little you will put a little bit of jelly here in the speculum and then you will try to insert it into the vagina then turn it around it has two handles you push one down and the other one up and then you will have it in place you will feel some pressure but it doesn't hurt and once you put it in you will grab the mirror and with the other hand, you will grab the flashlight and you will put the flashlight toward the mirror and will try to look for your cervix. I will try to look for any bumps or anything unusual on my vagina, any coloration, anything that could be unusual for me. Okay, it seems that my vagina is okay. Everything is, seems fine. Okay, so now you're going to hold the bills together. What I will do is with one hand I will separate my vagina. Uh, a lot of women want, you know, some women want to put some water or jelly so that the, the speculum can um, sleep easily. That looks like it hurts, does it? I will not go more than it, it hurts. I'm, I'm feeling it. Just a little bit of pressure. Can you see the, the, the short handle? I'm going to press it down and with the other finger I'm going to press it to pull it up. You hear that click? Mm -hmm. That means it's in place. Okay? Can you pass me the flash? Yeah, thank you. Okay, now I'm going to try to look for my cervix. Do you want to see? Who wants to see? Who wants to look first? Go ahead. Yeah? Now I'm going to take it out. And you're also going to hear a click. Okay, then I will slowly take it out. Okay. Well, I used self cervical exam um, to find out when I ovulated so I could use that to inseminate, and that's how I conceived Kylan. Another um, thing that we do in um, more advanced self help groups is what we call menstrual extraction. Uh, menstrual instruction was developed or was in use since early 70s when abortion was illegal. And women use it to, uh, like the name says, uh, to suction the contents of the uterus. This is the menstrual instruction kit. It's called DLM. Here, let me show you how it works. Um, first, uh, I would like to tell you that uh, we need a, a, a sterilized cannula. 
Okay, everything that goes into the uterus needs to be sterilized. Would you like to pump? Sure. There, okay. We usually let the woman ha who's having the menstrual extraction, we usually let her um, pump the syringe, but sometimes you know, a partner or a friend can do it. This represents the uterus of the woman. And you can start pumping. Can you see the water mm -hmm. going in? Okay. Try it. Okay. None of this air goes back into the uterus? No, that's why it's a one-way valve. If you can feel the other point of the valve, the air is coming through that way, not into the jar. You mean here? Mm-hmm, exactly. Where can you get a Del M? From what I understand, you can only get it through self-help groups, and they originate from feminist health centers, right? Right. Okay, the first thing that we need to do in a menstrual extraction is to feel the size of the uterus of the woman. We will put some gloves, we'll put two fingers inside of the vagina, and try to feel the position of the uterus. After that, we will give her the speculum. In a self-help group, we will always try to let the woman put the speculum in. She will um, grab a mirror, she will also grab a, a flashlight, she will look into her cervix. After that, um, we will have ready the instruments, we will um, have the O-rings, I'll already show it to you, and we will swab the vagina with betadine. After that, we, we will use the cannula, the plastic flexible cannula. We will try to put it into the us, into the opening of the cervix. Sometimes it's really easy, it goes in easy. Sometimes you have to put a little bit of, of strength, a little bit of strength. Um, after that, somebody or you know, some other person or the woman, she can you know, uh, pump the syringe and start with the suction and then we will move the cannula inside of the uterus okay the way you the way you do it is that you will just turn around keep turning around the cannula move in and out okay and after 20 or 30 minutes after that you will feel the uterus coming to its actual size and you feel some reaching and you can hardly move the cannula that's when you know that the uterus is empty. The woman may feel some cramping at this point. That means that, like I said, the uterus is coming back to its normal size. After that, we will, um, we will have all the contents of the, of the uterus in this jar, and you will try to look for pregnancy tissue. That's crinoid villi. It's a feathery kind of shape tissue. And if you put some water in, it will float. Selena, how is an abortion different from a menstrual extraction? Basically, it's the same technique. It's suction. They have an electrical machine that creates suction. And the difference is that the ME is a lot, lot gentle through the uterus. With an electrical machine, the abortion will be done in about five, six, seven minutes. And with the ME, it will take 20, 30 minutes. And he's attaching a clamp now to the cervix to stabilize the uterus. Okay, now what he's going to be doing is giving you the rest of the uh, carbocane injection. He's going to be giving the injection on one side of the cervix, and he's just inserting it now. And again, sometimes you feel a little sting or a pressure feeling. Mm -hmm. Okay, now he's going to be starting the dilation. The shot takes effect really fast, so you probably won't feel much of this. Now he's dilating once. Feel a cramp? Sleeping. Cramp? A little bit. And now he's doing the second dilation. He only has to do two. You felt cramping going in? Yeah, I see green. Okay, and now he's going to be inserting the cannula. And you may feel a cramp again. Come okay. down. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, now they're turning on the machine. Okay, and sometimes you may feel cramping, but oftentimes women just feel a tugging sensation. If you just keep your breathing really slow and relaxed, try and keep your bottom half real relaxed. This part of it probably only take about a minute or so. 
have any cramping? Yeah. Sometimes put your hand on your uterus and help it over too. It kind of stabilizes it. Okay, it's just about done. You feel any of the cramping now? Mm -hmm. That means the uterus is probably pretty much emptied and it's cramping down to its normal size again. You doing okay? Keep your eyes open. Nice, slow breathing. Okay, it's just about all done. It's just going around one more time to check. Okay, that's it. All right. That's all it is. All right. How are you feeling? Okay? Yeah. What are the risks in having uh, both procedures? Basically, they're, they're the same risk. Um, but in, abor in an abortion, you can have um, a high risk of uh, perforation. And in both procedures, you can have retained tissue. Thanks, Selena, for being here and sharing this. I've felt so helpless about the possibility of abortion becoming illegal, and now I feel like I've learned a skill, or at least heard about it, that I can use, or my friends and I can use when, when and if it happens. And I, I feel like the I've been... The law land is trying to supersede God's laws, and God says, Thou shalt not kill. I believe in the seed of life, and only God can give the seed of life. And man is trying to take the thing that God gives. Okay. What kind of job are you doing? Where's your family? You're protecting them, man. You're protecting these people. They're all murder babies. I don't care what the Supreme Court says. The Bible says, thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not kill. You're protecting the ones that are murdering. You are protecting. You're just like the, the Nazis when they were taking the Jews to the ovens. It's the same thing happening here. I don't care what the people say. I don't care what the Supreme Court says. Don't you see the murders going on in that building? Um, having the abortion itself was difficult for me, but this added a whole new dimension to it. Um, it uh, Suddenly I was, um, I was dealing with fear and intimidation and um, a sense that uh, I was about to be uh, publicly violated and um, and uh, emotionally assaulted. They're not just protesters and they're not just people trying to give counseling. They're violent and they're vicious. Oh, please don't do it. Oh, please don't murder your baby. Get out of the way of the patient. Don't go to that baby. Oh, please don't do it. Oh, please don't murder your baby. They don't care about free speech. What they care about is intimidating and frightening women. Under the guise of free speech and the pretense of God, they're violating constitutional rights of women. While the anti-abortion movement spreads across this country, pro-choice activists are themselves organizing. We'd like you to meet a woman clearly in the vanguard of this movement, B.J. Isaacson Jones from the Missouri Reproductive Health Services. The specifics of the Missouri legislation, which restricts the use of public funding to as much as counsel a woman around all of her options, the one of which is abortion. We see this as blatant discrimination against low-income women and their families as it endangers their health and the health of their children. The Missouri legislation restricts access and is calling for further restriction. What we believe is required is greater access. For our clients who have become interested in getting involved, they've generated a significant amount of activity. In just four months, they have sent 5,000 postcards and or handwritten letters to the Supreme Court justices, to Attorney General Thornburg, they have sent probably 6,000 to President Bush. They have signed on to the amicus briefs that NARAL is going to provide the United States Supreme Court. We have encouraged those interested to join now, to join NARAL. They're involving themselves in pro-choice rallies. They are sending letters to the editor uh, to the point where the pro-choice letters in the St. Louis area are outnumbering the anti-choice letters for the first time by 10 to 1. A major issue here is that women's rights are being attacked and threatened throughout the nation. And we need to educate people that access to abortion and other reproductive choices is slowly being chipped away. If I was pregnant, I'd be 
of getting on my knees and thanking God Almighty for having life come into my body. Unfortunately, not every pregnancy is the result of a loving union between a man and a woman. Human beings make mistakes. They're sometimes careless. They may be ignorant of the simple biology involved. We advocate better, safer, more accessible birth control and sex education for the proper use of this technology. It's important to remember that pregnancy can also be the result of violence, incest or rape. Should a woman who has already been the victim of one violent crime be forced to endure the emotional and mental violence of a nine-month pregnancy she never sought? In addition to these emotional questions, there is the question of simple economics. The anti-choice movement advocates the adoption of these children if the women cannot keep them. But what do we do with the children now in orphanages who can't find good homes? And what does the poor family do already facing financial obligations they can barely meet if they have another child to care for? These are complex issues. We hope that you are better armed now with facts to help spread the word. We must not let the radical right deny us our personal freedoms. And if our constitutional rights are eroded, we have alternatives. Knowing this, women need never again resort to such horrific measures as coat hangers, knitting needles, or backstreet butchers. Just too weak. 